So, part two, I've been talking about these two basic Quranic virtues, these pillars of the spiritual life. Fikr, meditation, contemplation, reflection, confronted with the, the signs of God in nature. And dhikr, which is remembrance, reminding ourselves of our divine source and the divine end of our earthly lives. Now, in the Quranic verse I cited a few minutes ago, um, we are told of those who remember God, dhikr, whether they be standing, sitting, or on their sides, and who meditate on the creation of the heavens and the earth. So these two principles, thikr and dhikr, are actually just juxtaposed in this verse. Now, the basic Muslim technique of remembering of dhikr is, of course, the five daily prayers. Um, in the Quran, God tells Moses, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ dhikri," And establish the salat, the prayer, for my remembrance, for my dhikr. And Islam has traditionally seen the formal prayer as a form of worship for beginners, as a form of purification for spiritual wayfarers, people who are a bit more advanced, and a form of union in some unimaginable, inexpressible way for the saints. And the hagiographies are full of stories that indicate the extraordinary state of absorption which the saints achieve when they're in the state of prostration to God. One early saint of Basra, for instance, uh, is said to have had a gangrene in his foot and he refused to allow it to be amputated. So his family told the surgeon to amputate it while he was in prostration. And the surgeon did this. And when the man finished his prayer, he saw that his foot was gone. So complete was his, his absorption in, in, in his prayer and in his uh, communion with God. And through the, the salat and the other five pillars, the Muslim life is punctuated by events of dhikr, of remembering. Minimum of five prayers a day, one Friday prayer a week, month of Ramadan once a year, um, etc. And the hajj, of course, once in a lifetime, minimum. And Pivotal to this system is, of course, the holy house of Abraham in Mecca itself, which um, functions both as a, a symbol and itself as a reminder of the divine throne, some of the literature. It's a, a metaphor for the divine throne around which um, the angels turn in adoration, like moths circling a flame. So the link of human worship to the cosmos is provided in this way um, by the movements of the sun. You'll recall that I mentioned in my lecture on Islam this fact that um, Islam is the practices of Islam are intimately related to the unfolding of of the of the natural order and particularly the the progression of the sun. Um, the moon obviously plays its part as well because it uh, determines the Muslim calendar and hence uh, presides over the timing of Ramadan, the annual zakat, and of course the Hajj. So you could say that because of Islam's unashamed binding of religious practice to the physical world, the five prayers, as it were, follow the passage of our planet through the void. And as the rays of the setting sun touch each corner of the, the planet, the Muslims who live there touch their heads to the earth in humility and in reverence. In fact, if it were possible to observe the earth um, from afar through a kind of spiritual telescope, you might see a constant, unceasing progression of five bands of lights, as it were, as people pray, constantly moving around the earth. Innumerable little points of, of luminous activity that together make up great bands of, of the recollection and celebration of God traveling around the planet forever. So the first point when you talk about dhikr is that its foundation and the foundational practice is these five daily prayers. They are, as it were, the, the framework on which the rest of the Muslim devotional life is hung. But fleshing out this framework, there are countless other forms of dhikr. There are a number of formulas which are included within the prayer itself um, that people say silently. For instance, the Prophet taught that um, during the prostration, which is the culminating moment of, of the Muslim worship, the, um, the devotee should say, uh, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, um, glorified be my Lord, the Most High. And there are a lot of other formulas that you say inside the prayer at each particular um, point of it. And there are a lot of others which are used outside it as well. 
um, there is a great wealth of devotional phrases um, which are repeated on certain occasions and that, importantly, can be repeated a specific number of times. Uh, for instance, in the Hadith collection of Bukhari, we read that um, the Blessed Prophet said, Whoever utters the word, there is no God but God, alone and without partner. His is the kingdom and his the praise, and he is powerful over all things. A hundred times in a day, he will receive the reward of liberating ten people from slavery. He also taught that one should quietly repeat after each of the five mandatory prayers, glory to God, and then praise be to God, and God is greater 33 times each. And there are a number of other key formulas that you'll hear Muslims saying almost incessantly. Astaghfirullah, for instance, I seek God's pardon. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah, there's no power and no ability save in God, and so on. These coming from the Quran or from the Prophet. Now, the Islamic scholars traditionally believed that each of these formulas possessed an almost incantatory property, um, a, a khasiya, a special virtue. Some of them, Muslims have traditionally believed, possess healing properties. Others can possess one, protect one from ill fortune or avarice. There are even some which we're told can protect one from magic. Still others can even protect one from the Antichrist. So it's been very common for scholars since the beginning of Islam to sift through the voluminous hadith literature and tweezer out these little formulas that the Prophet used to punctuate and sanctify his day and serve them up in little manuals, prayer manuals of devotion for ordinary Muslims, to be recited or to be chanted regularly. And as the Blessed Prophet himself indicated, there is a special merit attaching to reciting some of these a particular number of times. Now these scholars also, particularly those who were of great spiritual um, achievement, uh, commonly strung together these almost mantra-like formulas to form a whole, a whole unit of devotion could take 10 minutes, could take as much as an hour or even longer. And one of these was known as a wird. Wird is the name for perhaps litany, is the nearest equivalent in the English language. Literally, the word means a watering place. Um, just as the Bedouin in the desert has occasionally to take his, his camels down to the water hole, so also human beings need a wird, a place where they can go regularly to um, refresh and remind themselves by calling to mind and repeating words about their creator. And as with the five prayers, it's believed that there are certain particular times which are especially suitable for reciting a wird. And the Quran itself says, mention your Lord abundantly and glorify him in the evening and when the sun rises. So very typically, spiritually minded Muslims, after the dawn prayer is finished, or after the sunset prayer is finished, will stay in the mosque, perhaps for 10 minutes, perhaps for longer, and will recite one of these wirds. It's a very common practice. Sometimes they will do so individually and silently. Sometimes in some mosques, you'll see people doing them all together. Um, there's a famous hadith that tells us, people will not sit making dhikr of God without the angels surrounding them, mercy covering them, peace descending upon them, and God mentioning them among those who are with him. One of the meanings of this is dhikr in the sense of reminding oneself of the outward laws and rules of Islam, sort of scholarly activity, but it's also applied by the medieval scholars to invocating, in, invoking God, which is the, the fundamental meaning of the, the word dhikr. Now, it's recognized that while it's possible, in some circumstances necessary to make dhikr or to recite a word in private, it's generally recognized that human psychology being what it is, and for certain um, less easily uh, expressed spiritual reasons, it's preferable for these things to be done collectively. Um, one of the first to do this was the famous Princess Zubayda of Baghdad, um, who is said to have assembled all 300 of her servant girls in this sumptuous palace she had in the Abbasid capital. And every day, all 300 of them would recite the Quran together, so that to passers-by, uh, the palace sounded like a great beehive. Um, as they put it, its inhabitants garnering the sweet honey of divine remembrance. Now, I'm not able to record um, the servant maids of uh, Princess Zubayda, but what I have got here, with any luck, is a recording of a, a contemporary recitation of the Quran. This is from Algeria, which gives you some idea of what you can expect to hear as a form of dhikr after the dawn and sunset prayers in a mosque there. 
Obviously, in order to hold the collected reciters together, they do it in a very strongly rhythmical way. In fact, listening to the Quran like that is one of the easiest ways of um, hearing the very strong and complex rhythmic patterns that exist in, in the Muslim scripture. So that's a very common uh, site that you'll see in mosques, particularly in North Africa. In Morocco, in fact, every mosque um, that has a government-appointed imam is required to recite the Quran collectively in this way, one thirtieth of the Quran every day after the dawn and after the, uh, the, the sunset prayers. So this is a form of collective dhikr, uh, reminding oneself, in this case, through the Quran of the divine. But once it's not enough, and the Muslim saints constantly emphasize that the spiritualizing effects of dhikr are slow, but they are sure. And they recall the hadith of the prophet Everything has a polish, and the polish for hearts is the dhikr, the remembrance of God. And the Prophet's son-in-law, Ali, remarked that when anybody sins, a black spot appears in the heart. And as they sin further, the spot becomes larger and larger until the whole heart becomes black, and it covers the, the heart completely. Dhikr has a kind of almost detergent quality. Um, it has the effect of softening and cleansing the heart, rendering it able to perform its true function, which, as the Quran explains, is the knowledge of God. And Muslim poets often like to compare the heart to a tree which, slay, which sways in the wind of love and is watered by dhikr. So it has to be done regularly. So the beginner in the spiritual path, reciting these formulas of dhikr that he might have just inherited from his family or from his society, or perhaps received from a spiritual guide. The first problem he will encounter is that he falls into a kind of boredom. This is um, a concomitant of any regularly repeated religious practice. But we are told that we should not be dismayed. This is an obstacle that we simply have to pass through. The great Central Asian saint Abu Uthman al-Hiri was once asked by a novice who said, I remember God with my tongue, but my heart finds no intimacy with the recollection, with the dhikr, and the saint replied, you should rejoice, for at least one of your parts obeys and is rightly guided. Perhaps in due course your heart as well will come into harmony with it. 
Um, as the Muslim perseveres and tries to focus his mind and heart on the words he is repeating, God sees his struggle and brings an accord between his words and his state. You'll find something uh, very close to this in a certain tradition of uh, Eastern Christian spirituality. Those of you who have studied um, the Hazekast movement will know that there was something called the Jesus Prayer, which is a prayer about Jesus, an invocation which is repeated again and again. And it is said by some pretty um, authoritative uh, Byzantinists that this was actually the reflection of um, the time that the founder of the Hesychast movement, um, uh, Gregory Palamas, had spent at the Ottoman court. He spent about a year there um, discoursing with the Muslim divines. And it's thought that the introduction of this uh, practice, almost the, the mantra-like -like repetition of a sacred phrase, came into Eastern Orthodox piety from this root. What happens next uh, depends very much on the devotional tradition of the aspirant. I'll be talking about those traditions in more detail in due course. Um, I have a quote here from Imam al-Ghazali, who was certainly the greatest uh, systematic Muslim writer on the, the practical aspects of, uh, of the Muslim spiritual life, um, in which he describes the more advanced conditions that can uh, come to a spiritual traveler as he practices dhikr. Does anybody want to read this for me and uh, give my vocal cords a, a break for a bit? You want to, John? Yeah. The spiritual wayfarer should sit and say, for example, Allah, Allah, or glory to God, glory to God, or such other phrases as his guide deems appropriate and persist in them until his tongue ceases to move, and the phrase remains as though pronounced by it, but without the tongue moving at all. Then he should continue until even the effect of the phrase disappears from the tongue, and its form alone abides in the heart. He should next persevere until the form and letters of the phrase are erased from his heart while the reality of its meaning remains therein, is present with it, and prevails in it entirely. The heart will then be empty of all else, since whenever it is preoccupied with some matter, it will be void of all others, whatever these may be. Therefore, when it is occupied with the remembrance of God, which is its true function, will it needs fall empty of all other things. When the heart finally comes into God's presence, the glory of the lordly proximity will stand unveiled before it, and the true God will become manifest to it, and from the subtle effusions of his mercy will appear a thing which is itself forbidden to describe, or which rather cannot be encompassed by any description at all. Thank you. You'll see that he closes with the customary reticence of the mystic. He's only going to describe the path to God. He's not going to talk about or attempt to frame in human language the experience to which that path leads. So in this passage we find the great Ghazali explaining that the formula of dhikr itself should actually vanish as the aspirant progresses to be replaced with simply the concept that lies behind the formula and finally the reality that lies behind the concept with which it's connected. Now, in the Islamic conception, it's important to remember that there is a close link between the names of things given in the Arabic language, which is a language of revelation, hence a language of God, and their metaphysical reality. When human beings name something, that's just a, a convention. But when God does so, the word he uses is objectively correct. It is itself a perfect mystical incantation. Sometimes um, people make the slightly extravagant comparison between reciting the Quran in Islam and taking communion in the Christian churches, just as the Christian imbibes the word of God made flesh through the Eucharist. So the Muslim vibrates with the word of God made book in the, um, the Islamic practice. There's a parallel there which is interesting, although obviously these things should be treated with some caution. But essentially, this is how it's viewed. It's a kind of uh, resonating with the word of God and with the realities 
that um, God's word is pointing to. So each word in Revelation is itself linked and, as it were, cross-referenced to phenomena in this world or in the unseen. The Quran is a kind of great web, almost an internet, that links together um, everything else in, in, in creation and, and the unseen world. So the Muslims believe that to invoke, to do dhikr using a Quranic phrase, thus sets up some kind of vibration by which the invoker's heart vibrates with the thing that is signified. So the saint, as he sits apparently quietly on his prayer carpet with his prayer beads in hand, is in reality at the center of some unimaginable cosmic symphony, a state known only to himself and to God, and wholly incommunicable save in the usual ecstatic expressions of, of rapture and union. Now, when Muslims of a particular devotional tradition assemble together to recite a particular wird in company, they may do this in the mosque, which is still common in many Muslim countries. More usually, it will be in a private home or a special meeting house called azawiya. This is the usual Arab word. Literally, it means a corner. It could be translated as a lodge or a retreat. Um, the common Persian equivalent, which you'll often see, is khanqa. And this just means a place which is set aside for <coughs> mystical aspirants of a particular tradition, followers of a particular spiritual guide. And in these environments where they are amongst their own, they develop these traditions and it provides a, a safe context for the expression of the more often ecstatic aspects of, of, of religion, of those who have been carried away on the ocean of divine love. If you've looked at some of the uh, medieval Persian miniatures, which have um, facsimiles in the library here, you'll see that very often medieval Muslim mystics are standing up and um, in apparently ecstatic postures. When you see the real thing, it's not a kind of um, uncontrollable bubbling over. It's still a fairly sober phenomenon, but people are really wrapped and almost overtaken by the, the electricity of, of the divine love. The best known form of this upward movement, which is sometimes referred to not very accurately as a form of spiritual dance, it isn't really, um, is that which was founded by the great Rumi himself, certainly in the West one of the best known of all Sufi mystics, who founded the Sufi rite known as the Dawran, or at least adapted it in a particular form for the use of his own followers. Um, Occasionally, members of Rumi, Rumi's order, which is known as the Mevlavia, visit the West, and it's possible to see um, ceremonial public performances of this rite, which is actually very beautiful. These are the people referred to in, say, Victorian European literature as the whirling dervishes. In fact, they don't whirl at all. They move around in a very slow and dignified way. And the person who is doing this wears a long white robe, a long beige felt cap, and he will hold up his right hand like this, which is to receive the mercy from heaven, and holds his left hand down like this, which is to distribute it to earth. So he is the representative of man in this sense of, of pontifex, as bridge builder, as, as khalifa between heaven and earth. And as he does this, he turns around, which mirrors the, the turning movement which exists in the cosmos generally, and also calls to mind the, the ecstasy of the saint. It's said that the origin of this ceremony, which is probably the most spectacular and best known mystical ceremony in the Muslim world, is uh, an inc incident in the life of Rumi himself, uh, the famous 13th century mystic who lived in Turkey, that once when he was discoursing with his students, he was walking through the goldsmith's bazaar in the city of Konya, where he lived, and he heard um, the hammer of a goldsmith, a little thing, and the goldsmith himself was a saint, and the hammer was going tap, 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 tap. And Rumi, in some incommunicable way, picked up that the saint was actually expressing, even in his work and his craft, the divine name, Allah, Allah. And he immediately started to turn like this in a state of ecstasy. And subsequently, his followers have emulated him. That's the origin of the, the, the whirling dervishes, so-called. Usually only six or seven of them will actually do this in a group directed by a guide, 
Um, very often you'll find that it's accompanied by a small orchestra. I mean, Islamic music is a very diverse phenomenon. In, the, in Rumi's tradition, there'll be perhaps five or six musicians, including things like the Eastern equivalent of lutes and mandolins, a zither, a couple of drums. Um, and the ceremony begins with the invocation of blessings on, on the, the Prophet. And then the dancers rise to their feet. They take off black robes, which symbolize attachment to the world and also symbolize the grave. And underneath there are these pure white robes, which symbolize the, the purified human being and also our state of the resurrection. And then as the music goes, they begin to turn. And I've actually got a recording made in the 30s of some of their music. The quality is not very good, but it will give you some idea of the sophistication of this tradition. It's actually after this. I'll play you this one first. This is an Algerian form of dhikr. It's quite beautiful. characteristic of what you'll hear in one of these zawiyas, a Sufi lodge. Ecstatic poems of love for God and his prophet. Saying things like, the people of dhikr, of divine remembrance, are completely annihilated, completely lost in their beloved. So you'll hear some songs like this as a, a preliminary, and then in the Mevlavi tradition, there will be uh, uh, some instrumental music and these um, people will stand up and they will begin to turn. This is the, the instrumental tradition coming up. <laughs> 
the Mevlev is in particular famously use music in their ceremonies. Most Muslim religious orders, in fact, don't. Um, there is even a, a debate in Islamic law concerning the, the religious permissibility of music. Generally, it's been assumed in Islamic civilization that if music demonstrably conduces to a noble end, then it is to be judged according to the nobility of that end. So we find, for instance, in classical Islamic medicine, there's a developed theory of music that can be used for the treating of mental illnesses. And if you travel in Turkey, you can still see in some remote places some very beautiful 14th and 15th century hospitals in which there are actually concert halls attached. And um, these, the ill would be brought in and the musicians would play after the sickness was diagnosed and then the next person would be brought on. Music therapy is also increasingly being used in, in the Western tradition, of course. Um, and similarly, spiritual disorders, even more common, um, could also, many medieval th Muslim thinkers thought, be remedied through the use of music because of its extraordinary capacity to, to inspire or even to engineer states in the soul. And classical medieval, medieval Muslim music, which is itself a very intricate theoretical tradition, um, also had uh, a frankly religious philosophy lying behind it, an almost Pythagorean theory of the effect of certain harmonies on the soul. Um, now, very often in such sessions of dhikr in the zawiyah, the spiritual seeker will use as a form of um, invocation one or all of the 99 names of God taught by the Prophet, and most of which appear in the Quran. Some of these are known as the names of beauty, while others are known as the name of majesty. They divide more or less into these two, which corresponds also to the earlier distinction between the divine transcendence, the divine immanence. Jamal means beauty. Jalal means majesty. Two different aspects of divinity. So the names of beauty include things like God as the loving kind, the source of peace, the generous, and so forth. And the Jalal are names such as the, the overwhelming, the omnipotent, the judge, names such as that. Now, medieval Muslims looked at these 99 names and they saw that each of them, or the invocation of each of them, could have a demonstrable spiritual effect on those who used them as formulas of dhikr. Um, so, for instance, they said that reciting the divine name Al-Latif, which means like the, the subtle or the, the, the kind, will help to stabilize the seeker's spiritual faculties. So if somebody is in a very unsteady spiritual state, commonly the prescription will be to recite this particular divine name. We're also told that reciting the divine name Al-Qayyum, Quranic name of God, meaning the self-subsistent, attaches one to the protection and universal providence of God. So if your sense of, of God's providence seems to be attenuated, God seems unnecessarily or strangely distant, the recitation of this word can help. To chant al-Hafiz, the preserver or the protector, will help to preserve any spiritual state that you might have been granted, and so on. Very elaborate theory about the spiritual properties of each of the divine names. They also said that some very powerful names, particularly the names, some of the names of majesty, simply should not be used by beginners because they're simply too hot, too powerful. Although it's said that some very advanced, state, uh, advanced saints can recite them under certain um, closely determined conditions. Now, Ghazali um, continues after the passage which we, we just heard uh, by suggesting that the formulas of dhikr, whether they be Quranic or the 99 names or whatever, that the formulas of dhikr which bring us up to exalted states of, of awareness of God's present have to be chosen with great care and by an expert. The soul, he says, is a vulnerable thing. It's a tender thing in man. And the higher one attains in one's spiritual life, the more dangerous will be a fall. Each formula has been given a particular property or a power by God. So there has to be a spiritual guide who is like a trained heart surgeon who carefully chooses from the various surgical instruments that these uh, formulas of dhikr represent. Each one he will recognize is for a particular task suited to a particular individual, perhaps suitable for a particular time of day or time of the year. Again, a sophisticated science. Um, 
the mystic Ibn Khafif, for instance, in the fourth century, we find him saying, the recollected one is one, but the forms of recollection are many, and the conditions of the hearts of those who recollect are legion. So because of the complexity of the states of the human soul, far more complex, in fact, than the states and disorders that can overcome the human body, because of this complexity, there has to be a sophisticated spiritual guide, as there is in any tradition of, of mysticism. So Islamic spirituality uh, affirms the importance of what it calls irshad, spiritual guidance by a living individual. Um, so we find Rumi telling us, whoever travels without a guide needs 200 years for a two days journey. And once one has found the guide, one has to treat him with obedience, accept his insights and his instructions concerning one's spiritual life. Ghazali even says, let the aspirant hold fast to his teacher in the way that a blind man might clutch his guide on a riverbank, putting himself entirely in his hands and never disobeying his instructions. So those Muslims who are within the inner circle of the concentric circles I drew for you earlier, the people who aspire to Ihsan, must, as a condition for their spiritual progress, submit to a qualified guide, a perfected saint who has himself traversed the distance and knows the dangers of, of the route. Um, a famous Persian writer, um, Abdurrahman Jami, put it in these terms, all the prophets came to open people's eyes to their own faults to, uh, and to God's perfection, their own weaknesses and God's power, their own injustice and God's justice. And the spiritual guide is also there for the purpose of opening the eyes of his disciples. So in a sense, the, the saint or the, the spiritual guide is filling in for the prophet who is no longer with us, just as the prophet was not just the political leader, but also the spiritual guide of the companions, many of whom became uh, saints of extraordinary luminosity and generosity. So also the saint will emulate the prophet and take upon himself this responsibility of guiding, erring humanity. Now everybody recognized that the path to God is difficult, narrow, and hazardous. Progress is unlikely unless you take the hand of a master who's made the journey himself or herself, because it's worth acknowledging that in the tradition, um, a perfected saint or perfected guide can be a woman. And we know that the medieval Saint Ibn Arabi, for example, regarded by many as the supreme Muslim mystical writer. His first three spiritual teachers were actually women. I mean, it's not, not an uncommon thing. Um, and the function of the guide is not to take anything for himself. He doesn't claim remuneration or any honor or anything for this. He is simply there to liberate us from the lower possibilities of the human condition. And to do this, he may have to be very patient with us and the process may take a lot of time. Um, and his function is simply to inculcate in us this virtue of dhikr, not to turn us into something that we are not, but to remind us and to reorient ourselves back towards that primordial nature of, of, of orientation towards God with which we are born. Um, there's a nice medieval Persian story I have here. Somebody would like to read it out? Perhaps a lady? Yeah. The mystics of Islam tell the story of a lion striding through the mountains, who one day saw a ridiculous spectacle. A lion cub was shuffling along and dying like a sheep. With a great roar, the lion ran down the hillside, scattered the flock of sheep, grabbed the lion cub, dragged it into a pond, and forced it to look into the pond. Look, it said, you are not a sheep, you are like me, you are a lion. You are a lion and you have the truth, the sincerity, the passion, and the generosity of a lion. Then the lion gave an immense, glorious roar. The cub found himself both terrified and strangely excited by this. The lion turned to the cub and said, Now you roar. The cub's first attempts were pathetic, mewings, somewhere between a ba and a yell. But slowly, by submitting to the teaching of the lion, the cub grew into claiming his lionhood and began over many years to learn how to roar. Thank you. So that's a kind of simple metaphor of the function of the spiritual guide. He is there to bring us to our true selves, the theomorphic um, primordial condition, 
in which we were when we were with God before our birth. Now, the usual term for a spiritual guide in Islam is the familiar one of sheikh. Feminine is sheikha. Arabic, like many languages, likes to form feminines by adding an A. Um, and the disciple is known as a murid. Again, plural feminine, murida. And the term which means something like a seeker or an aspirant, um, and which is usually said to derive from a Quranic verse, which is Surah 6, verse 52, do not repel those who call upon their Lord morning and night, aspiring to his face. Now, following the prototype of all Islamic spiritual initiation, which was the pledging of the companions' uh, allegiance to the Prophet, the aspiring novice on the Muslim spiritual path requests bay'ah, which is the initiatic pledge of allegiance to his or her sheikh. Um, and the sheikh may accept him or her as a disciple, or if he decides that the disciple is, um, does not suffer from the kind of spiritual sicknesses that he or she knows how to deal with, may well send the, the aspirant off to somebody else who may be more qualified to deal with those particular ailments. Um, once the murid has accepted the guidance of the sheikh, he or she will be set certain duties um, which will help to grind down the coarsenesses of, of the ego. Uh, the most elementary of these duties and the most important is, of course, the recitation of a regular wird, which will be selected for him on the basis of his spiritual needs by the sheikh. <clears throat> but uh, certainly until very recent years, there were also other uh, duties incumbent upon the murid, particularly those who existed within this framework of the zawiya, the physical space where um, spiritual aspirants would, would exist and practice. Uh, typically, for instance, there would be three initial years of service. <clears throat> the first would be in the service of others, sweeping, cleaning, cooking, or whatever. The second would be devoted to worship and invocation. And the third would be in meditation and scrutinizing oneself. In each of these different stages, the aspirant would be taught different forms, formulas of dhikr to practice, both on his own and in the presence of, of, of others, in the regular gatherings of the sheikh's disciples. Most commonly, you'll find that these are held on Thursday nights. That's very typical throughout the Muslim world. Um, that after saying the night prayer in the mosque, um, the Muslims, those of them who are interested in spirituality and have a sheikh, will leave the mosque and will go off to the zawiya, and then they will have some of the songs and the ceremonies which, which we heard earlier. Um, and in some places, this is a very spectacular phenomenon indeed, particularly at certain sacred times of the year. If you go to the ceremonies of dhikr that are held to commemorate um, the birthday of the Prophet's grandson, al Hussein in Cairo, you will see perhaps a million people attending these ceremonies of dhikr. <coughs> it's quite a, a spectacular event. Um, all of the different spiritual orders will put up brightly coloured tents in the streets of Cairo. The old city will be completely clogged up with these tents. They'll have chairs or they'll sit on the ground. And in each of the tents, they'll be reciting their own tradition of songs and whatever. And they're all plugged into the, to the mains electricity and usually a lot of Cairo is, suffers power cuts at various points in the night because there's so many people there. They come from all over the country. Um, so it can be just two or three people doing their weir together or it can be a million people. Um, one of the duties that may well be laid upon the murid is the duty of what you might describe as apostolic poverty or fakr. As with Christian monastic piety, spiritual divestment from worldly ties is often accelerated or at least represented by physical poverty. Fakr simply means poverty. So the sheikh may well ask him if he sees that he's attached to worldly things to divest himself of some or even temporarily all of his worldly goods. Once he has done this and achieved the inward state of detachment that it entails, he is known as a faqir. Again, a female form by adding an A at the end, faqira. Just meaning a poor person, 
Uh, the more familiar Persian version of this is darwish, which gives us our English word dervish. It simply means somebody who is poor, i.e. someone who emulates the prophet's own poverty. Throughout his life, he lived in a single room without even a door. He just had a piece of sackcloth over the entrance. And he himself, when he died, he was just wearing a piece of woolen cloth. So later pietists frequently went to, to great length to emulate his example of, of, of poverty. Now, the purpose of Fakr was the, the whittling away of the sort of incrustations of worldliness, which have, rather like a cataract, grown over the spiritual eye with which we are are uh, meant to see God. And this process, through these faculties of dhikr, of fikr, faqr, and the other mystical virtues, are inescapably difficult and painful. If you go into the zawiyah of um, one particular religious order in Istanbul, you'll see that there's a beautiful calligraphic plaque on the wall. Traditionally, rather as in, say, New Mexican Catholic piety, people will donate statues, the santos, to a sanctuary. You'll find an equivalent in a lot of Muslim traditions, but they won't give statues, they will give calligraphic plaques, which will be all over the wall with Quranic verses beautifully inscribed. Now one of these in this particular place in Istanbul has the Turkish word teslimiyat written on it, which means submission. And you'll see that the dots in this word are picked out in red. And if you ask them why on earth are these dots in red, they will tell you that that's because the submission to God it's so difficult that you cry tears of blood. And the traditional assumes that this is a difficult path. It is the via purgativa. But the hardships must be endured, just as the hardships and sadnesses of childhood and education have to be endured if one is to become a full adult. Spiritual education, even more than physical or moral education, has to be difficult. Um, Rumi has a beautiful poem which I've actually included in the handouts. Um, I'll just read through it for you. The grapes of my body can only become wine after the winemaker tramples me. I surrender my spirit like grapes to his trampling so my inmost heart can blaze and dance with joy. Although the grape goes on weeping blood and sobbing, I can bear no more anguish, no more of your cruelty. The trampler stuffs cotton in his ears saying, I am not working in ignorance. You can deny me if you wish, you have every excuse, but it is I who am the master of this work. And when through me you reach perfection, you will never be done praising my name. So it's difficult. Submission to a spiritual guide is a difficult thing. In fact, in medieval times, no longer, uh, the spiritual aspirant, the murid, in order to emphasize this crushing of the ego, might well be encouraged to go out into the streets and actually beg, the money then being donated to the zawiya, which would use it for the feeding of the poor. And the function of this was to break the pride of the, the aspirant. And a familiar sight in traditional Muslim societies was the wandering dervish, wandering through the streets with his heart-shaped begging bowl, and perhaps also in Persia or Turkey, carrying a kind of ceremonial hatchet with two blades which would symbolize the fight against outward as well as spiritual enemies um, and going from door to door and begging perhaps singing religious songs and, and so forth it was really an everyday sight in islamic towns until two or three generations ago so characteristically there might be three years of initiatory purgative practice and after this the initiate might find himself invested as an outward sign of what the sheikh perceives and knows to be his inward progress with a robe known as the khirqa. Often this will be a patched robe as a symbol of the, the state of apostolic poverty. And often this will be a former robe worn by the sheikh himself, which is hence redolent with his blessings. And over the course of one's spiritual wayfaring, might, one might well acquire several such robes um, from the various spiritual teachers from whose presence one has benefited from. Um, all of this clearly stands within a tradition of renunciation that does seem to recall certain recurrent themes in medieval Christian piety. One thinks, for instance, of the wandering friars in Christendom. Perhaps they're quite similar to these wandering dervishes that, that 
were such a common feature of life in medieval Muslim cities. But there is a fundamental difference to bear in mind between Christian and classical Muslim understandings of renunciation. The word, by the way, for renunciation is zuhud. Literally means just not having something. Um, famous story about um, how one has to renounce the world and one's attachment to the world from the famous Ibrahim ibn Adham, a prince of the city of Balkh in Central Asia. One night, we are told, he heard a strange sound on the roof of his palace. The servants found a man who claimed to be looking for his lost camel on the palace roof. Blamed by the prince for having undertaken such an impossible task, the man answered that Ibrahim's attempt at maintaining a true religious life in the midst of luxury was no less absurd as the search for a camel on top of a roof. So Ibrahim, of course, duly repents and gives up his kingdom. And he, in, his, in Muslim piety, is the archetype of the wandering um, poor man who is the lover of God. But the distinction between this and medieval Christian conceptions of renunciation has to bear in mind the fact that the Quran has its own very distinctive understanding of the nature of the world. The world is ultimately a manifestation of divine love and the various Christian interpretations of the fallenness of the world were not carried over into Islam. So we find that Muslim asceticism has in practice been rather more muted than versions of asceticism that you will find, say, amongst the desert fathers of the church or in some forms of, of Hindu piety, the great feats of renunciation that one associates with them. Note also that there's no real monastic tradition in Islam. These places, the Zawiyas, or in Persia, the Khan Qas, are meeting places for um, the brethren of a particular spiritual tradition. People may live in them temporarily. Nonetheless, they are not monasteries, in as much as um, Islam assumes that following a spiritual life is not ultimately incompatible with also making one's way through the world, earning a living and supporting a family. So to be a religious person simply dependent upon the charity of others or on the, um, the largesse of an institution is something that, that is frowned on in Islam. Now perhaps the sharpest distinction is of course the attitude to sexuality. Celibacy in Muslim piety is particularly frowned upon. And here we see a big distinction between medieval Muslim and medieval Christian understandings of the, the ideal pious life. As is well known, Christian piety, until very recently, um, is, was very cautious about the sex drive of fallen humanity. Virginity was prized as the normal attribute of a saint. And one of the most characteristic features in, in traditional Catholic hagiography particularly is the person who renounces sexuality, renounces the body, lives a purified uh, spiritual, non-physical existence. So for instance, Gregory of Nyssa stated that if the life which is promised to the just by the Lord after the resurrection is similar to that of angels and release from marriage is a particular characteristic of the angelic nature, then the virgin has already received some of the beauties of the promise. If you look at um, uh, Peter Brown's book, uh, The Body and Society, uh, you'll see a very large number of examples of uh, the, the patristic and early medieval Christian um, desire to distance themselves from the... the uh, from the sexual drive. Islam's understanding, however, is that the celestial life of the blessed can't entail the deprivation of any of the God-given sources of delight which existed in this world, provided that they brought no harm upon others. The Quranic heaven, in fact, is strongly eroticized. <clears throat> Hence, celibacy on this earth can be no more than some kind of provisional strategy for the spiritual warrior. There's no long-term ideal of celibacy anywhere in Muslim piety. And of course, this received further confirmation from the example of the prophet himself. He said, marriage is my way, my sunnah, and whoever diverges from my way is not of me. And in, an in another, even more explicit hadith, <coughs> we find the prophet saying, in the sexual act of each of you, there is a charity. Even that is regarded as a good, um, benign expression of um, the religious and moral life rather than something that is, is problematic. <clears throat>
And in fact, one of the most consistent assumptions of Muslim writers on the spiritual um, life has been that the path to God more or less requires an active marital life. The Muslim saints characteristically are married, they are not celibates. And lust as such doesn't appear in the usual Muslim lists of deadly sins. In fact, we even find a, a very lively tradition of medieval scholars, um, both Kalam scholars and jurists and Sufis, writing <clears throat> what would nowadays be described as, as, as pillow books, explaining, for instance, the importance of, of such supposedly recent discoveries as contraception and female sexual satisfaction, emphasized very much in, in the Hadith. It's very substantial literature. Now, some even more adventurous souls even went so far as to weave this very positive view of human sexuality into their cosmology, seeing the sexual act as a kind of sacramental reminder <coughs> of the reconciliation and harmony of the beautiful and the majestic aspects of the divine. So in this view, the Jamal and the Jalal can be seen as a very broad parallel of the female and the male principles um, in the divine. So Islam's attitude to sexuality is consistent with the religion's underlying conviction that the world itself is fundamentally good. Nonetheless, the spiritual writers do acknowledge that since the spiritual path requires the strict renunciation of the inward vices, <coughs> such as covetousness, avarice, love of status, etc., then the treatment of these sicknesses may well require this kind of temporary abstinence from some of the things of the world. Um, hence this principle of faqr. So one can renounce wealth, renounce property, pro, um, property and so forth. Although the renunciation of sexuality is very rarely a theme in, in mainstream medieval Muslim piety. So we find that the medieval spiritual directors will say that to rid oneself of the vice of avarice, you have to give away your worldly goods as much as you can without, of course, compromising your, your family responsibilities until you become indifferent to <coughs> property, seeing it only as a means to an end. Love of status has to be combated by wearing simple clothes, um, avoiding positions of public esteem or, or prominence, <coughs> and in general, leaving, leading a pretty inconspicuous sort of life. Um, common advice is be a sparrow among birds. But the world itself is not condemned. <coughs> it is worldliness that is the snare, not the world itself. So we find a lot of cases of religious Muslims who rise to stations of, of, of considerable <coughs> success by the standards even of worldly people, but whose spiritual life remains vibrant. Um, an early Baghdad mystic called al junaid said, asceticism is for the heart to be empty of what the hand is empty of. <coughs> so renunciation of the world may be a temporary state but it is not necessarily a condition for a saint <clears throat> that he be poor or rich because he has actually uh, transcended any love of the world and is hence indifferent of what might be set before him or what might not. Um, and in fact, it's part of the Muslim ethos that begging as a permanent condition of life um, is something that is very much looked down upon if you, to beg for yourself and your, uh, in particular begging so that you can give money to the poor, as in the, the Sufi tradition is, is actually encouraged. <coughs> um, it suggests that God simply cannot provide for his servants in a more honorable fashion. So by begging, you are somehow insulting God. And there's a famous hadith in which the prophet said, it's better that one of you should take a rope and go to the mountains and return with a load of firewood on his back, which he then sells to become self-sufficient, than that he should beg from others. So implicit in this is the next of the great spiritual virtues of Islam. Again, a Quranic virtue, which is known in Arabic as tawakkul, which means reliance upon God. It's a nuanced um, principle. Dr. Muir yesterday reminded us of the hadith in which the blessed prophet told people to tie up your camels, then rely on God. And it excludes any idea of lazily giving up one's worldly responsibilities on the argument that God will provide. In fact, one of the divine names is Ar-Razzaq, the provider. Um, 
and the Quran gives the story of Abraham who was saved from Nimrod's furnace simply because he trusted in divine providence. Nonetheless, although we find occasionally early Muslim mystics wandering in the deserts, for instance, wrapped in the love of God uh, and confident that God will preserve them from the wild beasts, the lions and so forth that lurked in the deserts at that time, nonetheless, this was uh, ultimately regarded as an eccentric, non-mainstream form of piety. Didn't represent the usual Muslim understanding of tawakkul. Um, so we find, again, Junaid saying, I should write his name down because he's one of the great figures in the development of Muslim mysticism. Junaid of Baghdad, third century. Junaid said, the proper method of earning a living is to engage in one's activities in the same spirit as with works of optional religious devotion, not with the idea that they are a means of sustenance or advantage. God is going to provide for you. Nonetheless, he has commanded you to work for a living, to live honorably, to provide for your dependents and so forth. And this is in fact a form of worship. And very often we find even quite simple and um, almost apparently profane crafts in the traditional world become uh, f uh, formalized as guilds and those guilds themselves exist as spiritual orders in themselves with their own traditions of prayer, their own words and so forth. The guilds in particular in the Muslim world essentially were religious orders. Closely related to this virtue of tawakkul is another Quranic virtue of sabr, which means patient endurance, steadfastness, displayed in the Quran, for instance, in the accounts of the lives of, of Job and of Jacob. The Quran says, give good news to the patient who say when a misfortune strikes them, truly we are gods and truly unto him we shall return. And as um, one early mystic said, sabr is to remain unmoved before the arrows of the divine decrees. Whatever comes, you accept it with equanimity and with endurance and steadfastness because you know that whatever comes to you is from God. Um, we're coming to an end of this, and as I forewarned, there is more to this subject than can be squeezed into uh, a couple of hours. Um, let me just briefly say that the end of the spiritual life in Islam is two conditions both conventionally inexpressible in human language, the first, known as fana, literally annihilation. Once the coarser attributes of the ego are ground away and the heart is purified, the divine light starts to shine through the heart, which becomes like a, a perfected mirror in which the divine sun is reflected. And at that stage, the selfness, the I-ness of the saint is annihilated and all that remains is God himself. This is known as fanat, annihilation or passing away. But this condition is conventionally not permanent. It can be a flash, it can, be, it can endure for a little. But the perfected saint is actually in the state of baqa, which comes after the state of fanat. Baqa means continuance, subsistence, going on. Because once the saint has passed through this final purificatory experience of annihilation in the divine, he or she returns to the world and continues to exist as a member of society. Now, the saints who have achieved this have traditionally been accorded very great reverence in Muslim societies, much more than the reverence or respect which is shown, for instance, just to the imam of a mosque. The saint, for which the Islamic term is Wali, which literally means a friend, i.e. a friend of God, is regarded as being in this state of fana or baqa, and hence as being a living sign of God. The classical image again is that of the mirror of the heart being so cleansed that the divine sun blazes therein. And by being simply in the presence of such a person, one can be transformed. And it is these people called Wali who are fit to act as sheikhs, or spiritual guides. It's extremely dangerous to accept as a spiritual guide somebody who has not properly, um, has not properly completed the various spiritual degrees. And we find in Islam, as in Christianity, a very luxuriant tradition of miracle stories. 
One of the attributes of these people is that God works miracles through them. Not the great evidentiary miracles that are given to the prophets, but lesser charismatic events, um, which are almost a byproduct of the, this, this extraordinary um, state of, um, of, of, of the divine refraction in the human heart. Um, I have a story here from Rumi, who, like all of the classical writers on Islamic mysticism, knew that God can give such people miraculous, charismatic powers to heal the sick and to show all kinds of things, to show the relative nature of the laws of creation, which, the, which God can, just as he instituted the law, break the law just as easily. And the story is of Rumi, who was once walking in his garden where he taught in Konya, he used to teach in a rose garden. And he was being pestered by a uh, rather small-minded theological student who was very stubborn and very skeptical about Rumi's ideas of the path to God. And he was very brilliant nonetheless. And one day Rumi, despite his generosity, had really had enough of the student's endless displays of his own brilliance. And so Rumi said, let's go for a walk. And so they walked through this garden in the twilight. Rumi walks quietly and the student, who's baffled, just rattles on talking about clever points of metaphysics, waiting for him to say something particularly clever which would answer his questions. After a while, the saint raised his right hand and just pointed. At that moment, the student saw that all the trees and all the laden rose bushes in the park were bowing to Rumi. And then, in an incommunicable flash of realization, he understood. So it is the nurturing and the celebration of such people that is the ultimate function of Ihsan and ultimately the function of Muslim society. Everything in a traditional Muslim society is designed to point to the sacred and the function of the sacred in society is to raise up human beings to turn them into these extraordinary inexpressible bridges between heaven and earth, the perfected human being. And this tradition is traditionally is classically known as Sufism. The proper derivation of this term is from the Arabic word suf, which means wool, because of the um, woolen garb which the early Sufis used to wear in order to denote and express their, their renunciation of the passional dimensions of the world. So Sufism is this inner circle within Islam, and it is not possible to be a Sufi without being a Muslim. The Sufis traditionally have been the most concerned of all Muslims to uphold the classical forms of Muslim orthodoxy, even though they recognize that the theological points I was trying to set before you earlier can only grope towards realities that are ultimately inexpressible through rationalistic and, and human forms of expression. And every Sufi also has to be a Muslim because the model of the Sufi ultimately is the perfected human man himself, who is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyway, my apologies for this uh, necessarily condensed presentation. I've done no more, as I say, than to skate over the surface, but there are many books which have been written, and one of the great things about Islamic studies nowadays is that the books are infinitely and incomparably better, more sympathetic, more scholarly, more profound than they were, say, 50 years ago. And um, if you're interested, I can recommend other books which will take you further in this extraordinary discovery of Muslim theology and Muslim mysticism. Thank you very much.